So today we're going to look at the history of Mahayana Buddhism, its earliest origins, and then some of its later developments, coming right up. So I'm Doug Smith, I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association, that's secularbuddhism.org. If you're new to the channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled life, consider subscribing. So many of us will be familiar with Mahayana Buddhism. It's probably the most popular uh, form of Buddhism or school of Buddhism or group of schools of Buddhism that there is in the world. Uh, it's generally what we find in China and in Japan and in Tibet, and it's also in the West in many, many different places. So you, you will have probably known about it. Maybe you'll think that that's all Buddhism is. If you think that that's all Buddhism is, then I suggest checking out um, my prior video about the history of Theravada Buddhism, because that's a different kind of Buddhism. Uh, and also early Buddhism, which is more related to Theravada, is also part of that. But so today we're going to talk about Mahayana, which is uh, one of the, as I say, a very, very popular way of, of, of study and practice and, and learning. Now, Mahayana Buddhism is a somewhat later development. So the Buddha lived sometime, he died sometime around um, the 5th century BCE, so sometime around 400 BCE. And there were several centuries of development after that time. And Mahayana really didn't arise uh, until sometime around the 1st century uh, BCE. Uh, although there weren't specifically Mahayana uh, monasteries, that is to say monasteries that were devoted to Mahayana until something like the 6th or 7th century of the Common Era. So a long, long time after the Buddha's life. I think in, in, in the West we tend to think of the distinction between schools in comparison to Christianity, where we think of schisms, of perhaps even warfare between different schools of, of Christianity, uh, so that they, they disagreed about some facts or some, some claims or some beliefs, and as a result they split off into different groups with a lot of animosity. Uh, Buddhism has a quite different early history. It seems as though Mahayana Buddhism arose within uh, a, 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 mon a monastic context, and there wasn't a kind of clear schism like we have in, in, in Western Christianity. Instead, what probably happened over centuries is that you had people with different kinds of viewpoints about practice uh, and certain uh, beliefs as well, practicing within the same monastery. And so long as they could keep the same um, monastic vows, so long as they could keep the same monastic rules, that didn't matter, uh, because that was, it was only the rules that kept uh, monks together in the monastery. As long as they could all agree to the same sort of ground rules, it didn't really matter uh, your particular form of practice or your particular beliefs. And it seems as though there were a few causes and conditions that led to the arising of the Mahayana belief and practice system. The first was almost certainly uh, the death of the, of the historical Buddha. And after his time, what we find is a lot of uh, we, what we might call hagiographic kind of stories coming up about him, making him uh, more than just a simple uh, mere human uh, out trying to find out the truth about things, and more into a kind of a deified figure. With that came uh, stories about his prior lifetimes, known as the Jataka tales, at least in, in some, uh, some of these are known as Jataka tales. They're also in other parts of the early canon. Um, later stories were written about him. There are also other stories about other potential Buddhas that were written, and other stories written in his name. And along with that almost certainly came a number of what we might call meditative innovations. Um, that is to say, people who were meditators would uh, come up with uh, ideas while they were meditating. They might have, we might, I mean, in a, in a Christian context, they would be called revelations. They're not revelations in a Buddhist context, but they, they function in a kind of a similar way, or they might have. It's not entirely clear. That is to say, people might have had experiences or visions or ideas while they were doing meditation that they felt came from uh, the Buddha himself or some other kinds of supernatural beings who were, uh, that, as to say, on the Buddha's side. And so as these uh, innovations occurred and as the Buddha as a, a historical figure be became sort of changed and as his achievements became greater and greater and greater over time, uh, sort of expanded and expanded, 
his achievements became farther and farther away from those of the simple arahant. Now, if we've seen the earlier lectures about um, early Buddhism or the Theravada, we know the arahant was the is the is the goal of early Buddhism is to become an awakened being is to is to is to basically uh, overcome greed, hatred, and ignorance, and through that uh, the sort of cycle of samsara. Okay, so that was the early goal. And that was the goal that the Buddha himself believed he had achieved, the historical Buddha, at least insofar as we know from the early texts. But as the idea of the Buddha became grander and grander, his achievements uh, so far outstripped those of the mere arahant that it seemed as though he, ha he had an entirely different goal in mind. That the, what it was to be a Buddha was something quite different from what it was to be an arahant. It was almost to be a kind of a deified being. And along with that arose the idea that perhaps um, the Buddha had not died, that, that perhaps the Buddha talked about the ways in which the world, uh, our, our experience of the world was, was incorrect or was full of, uh, of, of misunderstanding and the world was to us something of a mirage. And so it might be that the Buddha's own death was a mirage, the Buddha's own death was a kind of a misunderstanding, and that the Buddha was still around and still could be, uh, could be asked to do things for us, or could be at least uh, an ongoing uh, figure within our lives. And over time, there was the production of a number, a very large number of what we might call from a Western academic context, uh, apocryphal kinds of stories. That is, stories written in the, in the Buddha's name that were supposedly composed by the Buddha, the historical Buddha, um, but were not actually so. I mean, they were written centuries uh, after his death. And we might wonder uh, how this came about during a, a period where people clearly knew that the Buddha wasn't around anymore. And it's clear that there were actually a number of arguments between monks about this, between monastics, uh, dis differences of opinion, where people would uh, have a text and try to justify its existence, even though other people might not have heard of it. Basically, some of that justification was based on what we might call these kinds of meditative revelations. Um, but also there were early texts there. In fact, there are certain canonical texts, a handful of them, that seem to be really late canonical, perhaps after the Buddha's lifetime, but in any event are part of the canon, at least the Pali canon in particular, such as one called the Uttara Vipatti Sutta, where uh, there's a, a discussion of, a, by a, a person, a man, who claims to be talking on the Buddha's behalf. And he's uh, basically a, a god talks with this man and asks, you know, how can you say such a thing? And this uh, this man basically says that whatever is well spoken is spoken by the Buddha. In other words, the Buddha, everything the Buddha said was well spoken, and so if I'm speaking well, I'm speaking the Buddha's words. And there are other texts like this where things, where I believe it said something to the effect of that whatever is well spoken, it can be thought of as Dharma or Dhamma, and whatever is Dhamma, of course, is the word of the Buddha. So, uh, I mean, at least in spirit, it's the word of the Buddha, even if he didn't actually say it. So all of this kind of, all of these kinds of, uh, we might say, reinterpretive kind of moves uh, work together so that when new texts arose, they might be taken, at least by certain of the monastics within, within uh, the monastery, as potentially credible. So we have basically what is the creation of a new path. Instead of the path of the Arahant, which is a, a more or less solitary path, I mean, with uh, in a monastic context usually, but a more or less solitary path working on your own to, to reach uh, awakening, which is, again, the, the destruction of greed, hatred, and ignorance. We turn from that path to what we might say is a grander path. It's a path of, of, of saving all sentient beings, of, of, awaken, of helping to awaken all sentient beings, of becoming a complete Buddha, as opposed to becoming an arahant, which was thought of as a lesser, as a lesser path. And you might imagine that there was probably some uh, significant a strain within the monastery here, because on the one hand you'll have uh, people who are more conservative who say, well, look, that none of this is actually in the old texts, and so you're not really practicing the word of the Buddha. And in contradistinction to that, the, the early Mahayana practitioners, proto-Mahayana, really didn't exist as Mahayana yet, on the, on their, for their part were basically a denigrating, and in many of the texts they do denigrate um, the what we might call more conservative parts of Buddhism, um, as being a lesser, as being uh, not as not as uh, 
uh, courageous, as being not as uh, compassionate as they were. And eventually this is where we come up with it, or where the name Mahayana comes up, because Mahayana means uh, the greater vehicle. It's the greater vehicle towards the goal, which in this case has, again, changed from mere becoming an arahant to uh, becoming a Buddha. And, and they would distinguish that from, in some texts, what's called the Hinayana, or the lesser vehicle, which they saw as all the other stuff, all the stuff that was sort of more uh, allied to, the, or, to the, the, the original texts that the Buddha might have, actually, might have actually composed. Of course, they didn't see them that way. They thought of them as the Buddha's, first ta- the Buddha's sort of first teaching, and they saw themselves as sort of uh, propounding the Buddha's second teaching, as it were. That is to say, his sort of wisest teaching, the, the teaching that was, that was hidden for a long time and then had come to, come to light. And uh, Richard Gombrich, the great uh, early uh, scholar of early Buddhism, has written, and, I, and other people have s- said similar things, that it's probably the case that, this, that Mahayana, the Mahayana belief system couldn't have arisen without writing, without the existence of writing. It seems as though uh, these texts in general began to be written down sometime around the first century uh, uh, BCE, um, you know, first, second century, something like that. And this is perhaps not coincidentally when we begin to get these Mahayana texts. And uh, Richard Gombrich's argument is quite interesting. What he says is, look, in the context where texts or, or, or uh, teachings were, were preserved by memorization, um, what you have is memorization by a large group of people. And the text that they memorized, well, they'd been memorized for as long as, you know, people could remember. It was the same text, or at least it was supposed to be. They were trying to preserve those texts. So there really wasn't an easy way for a new text to then enter that canon. Of course, there would be uh, modifications around the edges and so on, and people would make mistakes. But uh, the idea of an entirely new text that had never been memorized before, it's hard to see how that could have happened, at least not in most contexts. Whereas, if we had writing, then, of course, a new text could be written down and kept in a book and become and, and be uh, disseminated to other people who are interested and, in a certain sense, immediately have the same sort of textual validity as other texts that, that had been memorized before and had now been written down as well. Both of them now, we have the early texts and the more new texts that are on the same level now because they've both been written down and both can be preserved because they've been written down. So we get the bodhisattva path. The ideal of perfect Buddhahood replaces uh, the arahant ideal in Mahayana Buddhism. But of course, perfect Buddhahood is something uh, way, way bigger than us. It's something where we almost become deified. And so to get there, what we have is what's called the bodhisattva path. So the bodhisattva path is basically where we Uh, dedicate ourselves, we take vows to remain within this world uh, until all beings are, 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 are able to become enlightened along with us, at which point we become, we become a Buddha. Until that time, what we are doing is remaining within the world, helping uh, co- with compassion and wisdom, helping others. And that is the, the path of the Bodhisattva. In other words, we're sort of modeling ourselves on uh, the Buddha before he became a Buddha. Right, so he he went through it's it's said in the Jataka tales and other places, uh, you know, an uncountable number of left lifetimes until he got to that point. So what we're trying to do is model ourselves on that, and along with this path to perfect Buddhahood, there came up a whole bunch of new ideas about the ways to practice and the aims of practice, at least on a day-to-day level. So before, uh, if we've watched other videos on this channel, we'll know about. Uh, things that constitute what's called the 37 factors of awakening. And those are, are things such as the foundations of mindfulness, the jhanas, uh, the, the, the four efforts, uh, if, we, if we look under right effort, and many, many others. But instead, and, and those are that sort of the, the, if you like, the f- complete scope of practice within the earlier system. In the, in the Mahayana system, those are replaced, or more or less replaced, by what's called uh, the perfections, or the paramitas. And the paramita are a group of different kinds of, of virtues, if you like, that we are supposed to perfect in order to become perfect Buddhas. So the idea was that the, the Buddha himself 
Well, while the, the Arahants may have worked on these 37 factors of awakening, the Buddha himself would have worked on these perfections. And in the earlier texts there are six, in the later texts uh, there are something like ten. Uh, there are different numbers of these, but um, we'll, we'll talk about the early ones. Uh, and they go in, in a sort of a progression. Uh, generosity, virtue, patience, effort, concentration, and wisdom. And we can see that, we can understand that this is sort of a progression. We begin with generosity in the same way that the lay person begins by being generous. Um, and then we, we, we take virtues on, we, we, we behave ethically, we make effort, right? We're, we're patient, and eventually we get to concentration and wisdom. And the final, uh, at least of this early stage, is wisdom, which is known as prajna. And these are again the paramitas or the or the perfections. So the last of these of these perfections is prajna. And so if we think of the perfection of wisdom, that's prajna paramita, which is uh, a, a group, is actually a name of a group of suttas that were written, sutras that were written early on in the in development of the Mahayana that really uh, I would say helped to to really form the Mahayana into what it is these sutras on the perfection of wisdom, or, or Parjana Paramita sutras, that really did sort of outline what it was that we were supposed to be understanding, what the wisdom is that we were supposed to be gaining as we became Buddhas. And the idea is that these, that the perfection of wisdom, being the last of the perfections, encompassed all the other perfections. And so if we could only understand this perfection of wisdom, we would be able to understand all the perfections and gain them all at the same time. That is to say, we would gain the, the wisdom of the Buddha. And probably these, uh, these Prajnaparamita Sutras were, were composed, again, by people who had undergone very, very deep states of meditation. And they had taken the results of those states of meditation as instructive to, to writing these texts. In these deep states of meditation, they would get to places that were without sensation, without ideation, without thought, uh, very quiet. And this led to this notion that reality in its, in its, at its fundamental core was uh, without sensation, without perception, without, without any real ide ideation, that, that all of our normal ways of approaching the world were sort of radically misleading. So, you know, we would seem to see a world that was a certain way, but in fact, we saw nothing of the real world. We saw nothing that was real. We seem to have concepts that, that, that take us certain places, but in fact, all of our concepts sort of uh, fall away when we get to these deep states of meditation. So perhaps in reality, all the concepts really do fall away and aren't instructive of what really is going on. So all our thoughts, concepts, and perceptions are radically misleading, and reality is, uh, in fact, what, they, what, they, what we might say is empty. And uh, some of these ideas do come from the early texts where, he ta where the Buddha talks about uh, meditation on emptiness. And this is, this is then taken and sort of run with uh, in the Prajnaparamita Sutras to, to see that reality is this kind of emptiness. And it's further taken that, that, that if this is the case, there are certain paradoxes that arise. Uh, and, and these are discussed as well. So if reality is really empty, if reality in a certain sense doesn't exist the way we think it does, then the Buddha doesn't exist either, and the bodhisattvas don't exist, and the path doesn't exist. So we're left in a kind of a paradoxical state um, of not really knowing uh, where we are or what we're doing. And in the early texts, the, the Pali texts, or the early canon, early canonical texts, emptiness was, was associated always with uh, anatta, or non-self. However, um, as, as Johannes Brunkhorst, the great uh, scholar of the early tradition, talks about, there seems to have been something of a shift in how anatta was treated, a shift between the way it was treated in the early texts and the way it began to be treated. Because in the early texts, anatta was treated as sort of not-self, or non-self. So, for example, we would say, in meditation we learn that the pain that we experience is not self, it's not who I am. My possessions, uh, uh, my, my clothing, my uh, bank account, my uh, car, car are not things that are me, I'm not them. I shouldn't identify with them, because by identifying with them, I'm implicitly saying they're part of me, but they aren't me, they're non-self. In the early tradition, it was a kind of a, a psychological practice that was supposed to be universalized. So we looked at all parts of the world as non-self. However, in the later tradition, as we got forward into the Prajnaparamita Sutras and farther, this notion of emptiness 
shifted from being non-self to being without self. So it wasn't just that they weren't who I was, but that they didn't have selves at all. In a sense, they didn't really exist at all. And this, of course, doesn't only go for things in the world, but also goes for all of our concepts, all of our dualistic concepts. And so you get this notion arising of non-duality, that all of our dualistic concepts are sort of based on an idea that concepts have a certain reality, a certain uh, uh, fundamental truth to them, when in fact they're empty. They're empty of, of, of self, which means they, they don't really have a self, they don't really exist in some sense. So all of our concepts as well sort of fall apart, and all of our sort of dualistic thinking about the world also falls apart. And this kind of view in a very, very rough sketch is then uh, run with by perhaps one of the greatest uh, Buddhist philosophers, Nagarjuna, probably the greatest philosopher after the Buddha himself, at least the most well-known, who is the founder of what's called the Madhyamaka school that was a, a, a very, very important school in all of the development, or most, or much of the development of Mahayana Buddhism. However, that, the take that he gave, that Nagarjuna gave, was also controversial. And there were, there were uh, something of what we might call a backlash from within the Mahayana tradition. This feeling that maybe uh, some people, at least in the Madhyamaka, were taking that too far towards nihilism. And so their view uh, was that, in fact, while the world itself may have been without, without self, what we, what we find by, by doing meditative introspection is that, in fact, all the world is mind. That in other words, it's all mind created in a sense. It's all a pr product of our mind, of our thinking, of our ideation. All that we know are just thoughts and appearances. And so the aim then of practice is to, is to as it were, uh, purify this, uh, this great expanse of, of appearances and thoughts to a stage that is uh, like a Buddha. And there is certainly... Some, some parts of the early texts that, that talk about luminous mind, usually in the context of, of jhanic meditation, but those were taken by this new group of, of, of Mahayana uh, practitioners and, and teachers uh, to mean the stage of, of, of awakening. So the, the, the Buddha stage, the stage of becoming a perfect Buddha, was the stage of reaching this kind of luminous, spotless mind, a mind that they would say, um, was uncreated. It was it was sort of ident identical with with uh, awakening itself, uh, with with nirvana itself, and nirvana being the stage, uh, the state uh, that was that was non-produced, that was uh, supposedly outside of causes and conditions. Then they th they thought of this mind the same way, and that became one of the origins of the Yogacara school, the mind only school. Although not all of the Yogacara believers believed that all that there were were minds, at least what they would say is that all we have access to are mental kinds of states. And then the idea of this limitless, spotless, uncreated mind was seen later as um, the sort of Buddha latent within us, and the Buddha with, latent within all things, where we understand all things as, as all things that we have experience of. And that, uh, that kind of, of way of taking this uh, became what's called Buddha nature, or the Tathagatagarbha schools, uh, or, or ways of thinking about uh, Mahayana uh, 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 practice and belief, so that the Buddha, uh, the Buddha became, went from being uh, an actual person with a certain history, to being a kind of a, a, a spotless nature uh, of mind, latent within all things and latent within ourselves. And this kind of this, in a strange way, I mean, this is, of course, uh, some, this became a controversy. I mean, there were controversies all the time between these various ways of interpreting the Dharma. Um, but one of the ways of seeing this is, is that it became a kind of a reification of the self. The self uh, sort of comes back up again in, in, in the, the, the form of Buddha nature. What may be said is that this Buddha nature is, is of the nature of, of, of emptiness. It doesn't really exist in that sense. But that wasn't always the way it was taken, and not the way it was necessarily taken. Um, because many people did see it, or might see it, as a kind of a shift over to an earlier form of thought, in particular uh, the Upanishadic form of thought that the Buddha himself was in opposition to. If we, if we know about the early Upanishads that were written around the time, or a little before the time of the Buddha, uh, one of the things in the early Upanishads was this uh, notion that's in Sanskrit says tat tvam asi, 
you are that. And the idea was that you yourself, your Atman, your soul, was identical with Brahman, with the, with the universe, with all things. And so the, the aim of uh, this kind of Brahminic uh, religious goal, the, that their aim, was to understand this way that you in yourself was, were identical to the Brahman, the, the universal soul. And in a way, this, this, this aspect of the Tathagatagarbha schools sort of reified that. They sort of, they sort of brought that up again, in, 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 but in, in different terms, in terms of emptiness, where you're understanding that your own emptiness is the equivalent of this kind of Buddha nature that pervades all of reality and that sort of sustains all of reality. That's all of what reality is at its basis. And in fact, in one of these uh, Mahayana Sutras, the Lankavatara Sutra, they talk about uh, just this, this question of, of to what extent this really is uh, just a sort of a Brahminic teaching all over again. So we know that these things were controversial. So what we see in general in the history of the Mahayana is a number of innovations. It began, again, not as a schism with any other school, but simply as, I think, people who wanted to press the boundaries a bit, people who were perhaps a little bit less conservative in their opinions who may have had certain kinds of meditative experiences, who may have had a certain sort of a longing for an understanding of the way the Buddha really was, uh, people who were not satisfied with the old practices, people who were not satisfied with a solitary, a relatively solitary kind of practice, but who wanted something that was more overtly compassionate. And all of these, these different ideas sort of came together into to making the Mahayana that we know today. If you have any questions about this, I'd really love to hear them down below. I'm sure many of you have experience practicing in a Mahayana context. I do uh, in a Zen context, and as well I've had experience in Tibetan contexts, and know this stuff somewhat from the inside too, and you'll see uh, bits and pieces of all the things I've discussed in either of those. Certainly in a Zen context, you'll hear some of them. Um, so, And this maybe give you an idea of where they may have come from. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to catch you on the next one of these videos. And meanwhile, be well.